Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 762. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today, September 30th, 2022. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. If you could please like this on Facebook or YouTube, be sure to share it with your friends. We had a lot of people share the last episode. We appreciate that very much. If you want to be part of the show, please go to the comment section and add your comments, news requests, ideas, or just tell us when we're right and maybe wrong. That's what the comment section is for. We have all just watched the news for the last couple of days and watched Hurricane Ian hit the shores of uh, West Florida. And I thought we could talk about that because George and I are both residents of Florida. I'm there part-time. George is on the West Coast full-time. And uh, people have been asking through Facebook and uh, through um, email, is George okay? Is his wife okay? What happened? We uh, don't have any idea uh, specifically where George lives. And so we thought we could give an update. George, what happened and how are you guys? Well, Kevin, I want to tell our Anglo-Catholic viewers that my church is the highest Episcopal church in Florida meaning that uh, we're at 80 feet elevation and uh, our top of the steeple is about 150, 160 feet. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> high church. We, we, we're high church. Um, the hurricane had been forecasted to come ashore in our county, uh, but a uh, day or two before, and so we'd spent the last few days running around getting, I was, uh, teams from our parish were going around securing homes for some people, mm -hmm. Uh, helping others evacuate, uh, finding places for people to stay through the storm. So we had a so pre-hurricane uh, fury of work. Storm came, then the day before it was to come north, it took a turn to the east, came ashore at Sanibel Island, Captiva Island actually, and went across Punta Gorda, Fort Myers Beach, and the south side of where the winds and the water came. What was fascinating here is that we live on King's Bay, which um, all of the water was sucked out of King's Bay um, as far as the eye could see. It was almost as if there was a tsunami coming. All the fishing boats, the commercial boats were all sitting, uh, all the boats were on the, on the uh, grounded. Yeah. It, because all the water was sucked out by the hurricane and all that water was pushed ashore from Marco Island up to uh, uh, Sanibel and North. And then it came ashore, it went across the state in a diagonal, it went over Highlands County. My old parish in Avon Park, uh, the 90% of the power is still out there, the phones are down, but the diocesan youth camp and uh, the parishes in Avon Park, uh, they had the full force of the hurricane's winds and water, 18, 20 inches of rain in some places. Went over Orlando, then it headed out to sea over Daytona Beach. Mm -hmm. Meaning we only had winds in the 30 miles per hour range and only three, four inches of water because all the water was sucked south. I spent this morning, you can see how I'm dressed, uh, <laughs> picking up palm fronds and branches and tree limbs around the church and around the house and helping people get back uh, into their homes. Um, some people really made sure that no looters would get into their house, which meant they couldn't get back in either. <laughs> they couldn't find the key. Well, uh, They couldn't that's... find the key, and they, and they nailed this wood over the front door. And so I was there, Father, can you help me take this board off my front door? Oh, I have to tell what? you something funny. We have, we have one uh, couple where the husband's on kidney dialysis, and they live in a mobile home. Uh, about a mile from the ocean. So, of course, they had to evacuate. So they mm -hmm. made plans to get a hotel room in Inverness, which is uh, the county seat. It's a beautiful hotel, the, huh? Yeah. Uh, it's an old floor. It was actually the site of an Elvis Presley movie uh, way back in the early 60s where Elvis stops at a uh, atypical southern town. That's so they it. picked it in <laughs> Inverness, Florida. Yeah. Well, the husband made the reservations uh, online and when they got to the hotel, the, they found out they had made reservations at the uh, 
Holiday Inn Express in Inverness, Scotland, not Inverness, Florida. <laughs> and it was a non-refundable $600 bill for oh, two nights. No. So, but, but I no. thought that was funny. That is kind but, of funny. Uh, I mean, the, the most dangerous thing I find with Florida residents in a storm is all these lawn gnomes they have and uh, uh, other things that they have barraged around their property. Uh, and in good southern terms, some of the rednecks don't pick up around the yard as much. And there's lots of objects that could be flying through the air that would be dogs, dangerous. Cats, dogs, children, cats, children. Yeah. <laughs> the works. Car now, seats you, on the front porch. Yeah. <laughs> Now, in all seriousness, if you look at some of the uh, aerial photo uh, videos that are coming out now, some of the drone footage, uh, I see that Sanibel Island has been largely wiped out. There are some houses in the northern part of the island that remain, but if you, the further south the, the drone footage went, you're seeing absolute devastation. So it's not just flooding, it's missing homes. Um, and you're right, there was a 12-foot storm surge where the ocean itself just comes up onto the shore for miles um, and, and flooded many areas and that's why we're seeing all these boats that were in the the harbor uh for you know for years now sitting in people's lawns and uh it's just tremendous to see this type of devastation i know that area very very well and in fact i uh, i was a candidate to be a rector of saint raphael the archangel on fort myers beach mm. uh which was one of the barrier islands totally wiped out this is about 25 years ago um one of the things that we see is that the new building codes work. Mm -hmm. The big, giant, multi-million dollar McMansions built on, Cap on Sanibel and Captiva, they're still there. The house is built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, yeah. closer to the town itself. They've all been wiped out. So the new hurricane, and if you look at pictures of Fort Myers Beach, the condos, which are new, they're all still there, but all between each condo with these little ticky tacky Florida houses or shops or restaurants, uh, the wooden piers, all that stuff's gone. Um, we don't know how many people have died. We assume, in my congregation, I have people I knew who stayed in their houses, uh, in their trailer parks, uh, because they had nowhere to go. They didn't know what to do and they had dogs or cats and they didn't want to leave and they wouldn't come to the church they just wanted to tr stick it out at home they wrote it so out. they're gonna they're gonna be people like that and if you have 12 feet of water in a mobile home you're dead uh because this hit and the coast guard and the uh national guard they can't get to you till morning uh or until the winds die down so well, we'll, yeah, we yeah. will have deaths. And yeah, I think we this, will. The, the governor said that 17 confirmed at this point, but it'll probably be much higher. I think it will. Right now, they're still in rescue mode. You know, they're not going to go and count the dead until they've you know, sure that everybody they could rescue has been rescued. And then they go back into the houses and, and uh, confirm who's been uh, killed. And then there's people who were in the flood and they died of a heart attack, not the flood. So the coroner mm -hmm. has to figure out, you know, what did they die of? So it's it's something we need to keep in our prayers. And I want to warn people right now, this is the time the scammers come out. You're going to see a lot of GoFundMe uh, um, pledges and a lot of uh, give to this organization, give to that organization. You need to be very careful about who you give money to in Hurricane Relief. I would recommend the Red Cross, Anglican Relief and Development. Uh, are some Samaritan's others Purse. Samaritan's Purse. Uh, be very careful where you're giving money. If somebody pops up with a GoFundMe page and says we're the the official Fort Myers uh, hurricane relief, but probably not, and your money's going to waste. Be careful. It, the, uh, in 2004, our house was destroyed in a hurricane when we lived on the barrier island of Vera Beach. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get back for three or four days because the island was closed uh, while they cleared the roads of rubble and... Uh, turned off the electric, you know, made sure there was nothing that was going to kill you, gas lines or electric lines. And when we got back on the island, what we learned was that the initial damage took the roof off, but the, it was the mold and the mildew and the corrosion from the water that destroyed everything in the house. So it, you know, it may have survived this, the rain, but four days in the Florida sun with the mold and mildew of standing water destroys all your furniture all your clothing all your books anything that has any uh, 
soft soft materials mm -hmm. and the other thing to rem remember is that there's always it i'm the first to want to go see i want to get in the car and go look when you know that's one of the first things i did when the storm passed i drove around the neighborhood to see what was going on and um naples sanibel island uh captiva island are some of the wealthiest communities in the united states and what's going to happen is that looters uh, well fortunately these are islands and the national guard and florida national guard is out there with their guns uh to make sure that there's no mass looting now because these are islands those homes won't be looted but for the middle class homes and the poor homes on the mainland uh this is a time when looting takes place um, yeah. we saw this in katrina uh now florida you know florida is a much better run state than louisiana uh and new orleans certainly so we won't see the breakdown and the corruption that we saw there but it's this time the aftermath um today walk you know today everybody that i've encountered is in a foul mood Mm -hmm. because for two three days they've been locked up in their house watching jim cantore tell them that the world is going to end because of the hurricane and get everybody gets all hyped up and once it passes there's a sigh of relief but the build-up tension of the past few days is extraordinary and it's exhausting it's exhausting and i just well, pray for those i Pray for the tough time. The fear has passed, but now comes the loss and the mourning and the anger mm -hmm. and the acting out. And the, these next few weeks are going to be tough on people. It is. It's a, it's the mental health crisis after the the storm. Uh, a lot of people are going to have PTSD after this. Um, and so the next thunderstorm and stuff like that causes even more anxiety. And we see this very often after big uh, catastrophic events. 9-11 caused a whole generation to have anxiety. And so um, you need to keep that in your prayers as well. And understand that when you're talking to a person from Fort Myers, they may not want to talk about what happened uh, the last week of September. Yeah. Oh, I just pray that uh, I, <clears throat> I, wanted, I wanted to second what you were saying about the charlatans. Mm -hmm. They're not just the, the crooks. They're the people who will use these tragedies for their own purposes, whether they're political or financial or religious i mean it's too bad pat robertson's not around to tell us this is god's uh punishment, punishment for us yes. in other words you know when haiti is wiped out when haiti was wiped out by the hurricanes and um, uh, earthquakes pat robertson would say well it's god's curse on them for voodoo and stuff um, hey, hold on a second i saw many tweets that this is karma for DeSantos uh, passing the don't say gay bill you know that there's a lot of horrible evil people out there who are willing to to say stuff that is just absolutely cruel in the time of of uh, crisis but, but our one but our governor has sent all these illegal aliens up to washington and new york and martha's vineyard he was getting them out of harm's way he should be praised forethought forethought yes forethought yeah. all right well let's so, move on to the news believe it or not kevin there are mean people on the internet on twitter on facebook there are mean people <laughs> go figure they had to show up somewhere all right so let's move on now we have the opposite problem of last week on our last show we had very few news um items to talk about and uh I'll, we had to fill an hour here we have seven news items we haven't talked about yet and we have 45 minutes left because we talked about hurricane ian the first um news story we're talking about is the diocese of the upper midwest report has been released it's a uh 54 58 page uh, pdf that uh, i had to read through uh of all the interviews they conducted um and we got a correction that i needed to offer because it's related to the story uh, we talked about acna 2 and the uh, twitter verse from uh, c4so last week and one of the uh, uh, uh leaders or heads of that organization has sent a correction to some of our, our reporting um george you have that in front of you yes uh there were th uh, three factual points they wanted us mm -hmm. to clear up first mm -hmm. uh we said that most of acna 2 was related to c4so only some of acna 2 are some, related yeah. to c4so so that was uh, a mistake on our part 
Absolutely. I said that there seemed to be a familiar relationship with a, a somebody's daughter was working for RNS and writing these stories. No familiar relationship uh, between the ACNA two leaders and the religious news service. So that was a mistake mm -hmm. on my part. And then uh, we were not clear. And uh, when we went on to discuss the Jay Greener investigation, uh, Jay Greener was an, a, a C4SO priest who's been disciplined for misconduct. And it was implied that ACNA 2 has not reported on that. They have reported on that several times. Uh, it's not really been on my radar, but that's no, really wasn't, uh, that wasn't yeah. the, that wasn't the point Kevin was making. Right. The, the thrust of that discussion was the, the C4SO Twitterverse, the people who really came down hard on the upper Midwest all of a sudden went silent when uh, the same thing was happening in their diocese. And uh, it was not to criticize ACNA2. Uh, we've been following ACNA2 since you started, uh, and we've been hands off uh, as far as your reporting. And, uh, you know, keep up the good work and uh, let's move on. George, uh, let's talk about the report Diocese of the Upper Midwest. Uh, <sighs> I don't see, and if you get a chance, go to Anglican.inc. We have the report there, and I don't see any cover-up after sitting through 58 pages. I see a lot of uh, inexperience. I see a lot of young organizations. You know, we, we sometimes we say uh, the ACNA is a mature organization. I see a, a little bit of chaos of how do you deal with something so horrid um, at many different levels how and how do we solve that problem and they couldn't figure out a way to solve the problem george well there's a villain in this story and it's mm -hmm. uh, mark rivera the man uh, on trial for sexual uh, assault Allegedly and sexual we don't assault. need he's yeah. on trial for it yes I he guess. has not been convicted yet that i'm aware of yeah. um the uh that's the only villain here there's the reports showed no malice on the part of anybody in the upper Midwest clergy or administrative ranks. Um, they addressed this as they thought best, addressing it in a pastoral response first. Um, there was one discussion where uh, Stuart Rook, the bishop, uh, said, you know, there's the church's response and the police's response. We'll let the police do their work while we do our work, which is reconciliation and care of those who've been hurt. And none of that, in any way, shape, or form that I could see, amounted to any sort of sense of cover-up or trying to avoid taking action. Far from it, they just didn't seem to have a checklist that they followed that would have covered all bases. Was it a mistake to divide the police side from the pastoral side? Maybe, Probably. maybe not. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, that's, a, not, a of, that's not cover-up. No, and a lot of people were looking for a smoking gun. Now, mm -hmm. when you read the report, the end of the report it says, we did not do an investigation to determine fault. We did an investigation just to interview, which was requested by uh, the ACNA. We, so there's no judgment here, but here's all the interviews we did. Here's um, what everybody said during the interviews. Backing up from that, there are people who've complained that you know the ACNA should have done this then. I think those val some of those uh, um, complaints are valid. Um, yeah, and, and some of them are unreasonable, too. They ask mm -hmm. for a degree of omnipotence on the part of the ACNA that no organization is going to have. You're never, you know, when, when you're a victim of a crime um, and you want redress, there's only so far you can go. And I'm actually coming, I've, in reading this, I've come out more sympathetic to the ACNA leadership in that diocese. I don't think that some of the accusations made against them stand up in light of the facts. Now, I don't know everything. My ba no. meeting is based on this report, but, and I don't, nor do I see this as a whitewash or an exoneration uh, where they set out to exonerate. Rather, they set out to find the facts, reported the facts, and I'm just sad that this that how Satan can use one evil person to destroy a good organization. Yeah. 
Now it's it's well, it, but it didn't destroy organization. It just brought questions. You know, AC and yeah. is going yeah. strong. Upper Midwest will survive this. Uh, the greenhouse movement um, uh, may have to really do some restructuring uh, within its its realm. I don't know all the answers to this. I do know that there was no smoking gun here, um, and I think that's there is the, that's no the analogy. Yeah. Uh, no analogy to the Roman Catholic uh, abuse cover-up scandal. There's nothing even close to that. Um, there's no sense of we have to protect the clergy at all costs and the people are disposable. Now, I've, I've reported extensively on those things and those sorts of situations in the Episcopal Church and the Catholic Church and other institutions. Nothing like that at all. It's just inexperience and not a clear guidelines at, that are implemented and followed up now they may have guidelines but I don't think the, the degree of training uh, certainly in my case uh, I'm in a mature institution and I've got training constantly so for me if I have such situations it's almost second nature here's what I do and my opinion doesn't matter whether it's pastoral or criminal. Here's what I do. And I think in time, that will be the uh, mindset of the rank and file clergy in the ACNA, that they know what to do. It's not, there's no judgment call on their part. Here's what they do. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe it's a function of training. Maybe it's a function of uh, implementation of uh, existing protocols, but no malice that I saw. No. Nope. Okay, we talked that one to death. There will be more news uh, about the Upper Midwest Report because uh, this came out on purpose while they're having a conclave uh, here at Ridgecrest. And I would expect some, now that this report's been made, some press releases from both the Diocese of the Upper Midwest and the ACNA. Uh, and they may have put together during this conclave a better training on how to deal with this type of thing. Because in this day and age, where uh, pornography is rampant, where broken families are rampant, where um, just the over-sexualization of our children is rampant, this will happen again. I guarantee mm -hmm. it. Next time it happens, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I think uh, the ACNA uh, bishops had a great chance to uh, to address that here at the conclave this week. Next story. Oh, this is a fun one. The Orthodox are going to uh, <clears throat> lose some hair over this one. Uh, Karel says, if you die in battle for Russia, all your sins will be washed away. Wow, George. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Oh my! On uh, sun on Sunday, the twenty fifth, mm -hmm. Patriarch Kirill of Moscow and all Russia gave a sermon that's broadcast, where he stated that soldiers dying in the Ukraine would have all their sins washed away. Kirill's become a Roman Catholic. All he is cool. now. Now there is no Pope in Orthodoxy. It's just this only applies to the Russian Orthodox, mm -hmm. but the Catholic doctrine of indulgences whether partial or plenary where uh you can uh by an act or an action uh take away the penalty of sin uh going on a pilgrimage doing this doing that can remove parts of the things they would have to have washed away in purgatory um well we protestants don't believe in purgatory therefore indulgences are you know they're not on Martin Luther had something to say about this, and I don't want to get into the doctrine of indulgences, <laughs> but the Catholics have a doctrine of indulgences. Sure. Protestantism does not, nor does orthodoxy. Oh, that Russians, just changed. That just changed. Orthodox, orthodox spirituality does not have a doctrine of indulgences because for them, Jesus is absent. When basically, if you do an act, a good act, that does... And, and then that act takes you to paradise, what's the place of Jesus? And so Kirill, several things to comment. He's made this statement, which is an error in Orthodox theology. For me, an Episcopalian, to tell him it's an error, it's pretty, pretty uh, uh, Im uh, impetuous for me to, to say that. Nonetheless, what I understand of Orthodoxy, it's an error. 
And I think several things are going on here. First, uh, if Putin falls, if Russia fails, Kirill's out. He's so deeply tied himself to the Russian state at this point that there's no backing out. Second, what about all the atheist soldiers who are dying in the Ukraine for, for Russia? Or the Muslim uh, from the soldiers from the Caucasus and the Chechens? Are their yeah, sins washed does. away? Yeah. Yeah. In other words, how does this possibly work? How can being... Now, I can understand if he meant to say that if you were a martyr, but he didn't say martyr. He just said soldier, all soldiers dying in the Ukraine for Russia would have their sins washed away. Well, he has implied that this is a Christian war, though. In, in, mm-hmm. in early on, he implied that what Putin is doing is to save uh, Orthodox Christianity and the Orthodox Russians from Western influences. Mm-hmm. And so maybe he wants to imply that this is martyrdom. It could, and I'm I'm speculating that because the Putin called up three hundred thousand con- con- uh, reservists. Mm-hmm. So far, the battle, the fight's mostly been with second-line non-Russian ethnic troops. That they're sending the troops and the units that are raised in the Central Asia and the Far East and from the Caucasus, they're the cannon fodder. And the Russian ethnic troops really haven't been sent into battle yet. Now they're sending them in and they're calling up the con- the reservists. And they may start calling up classification of draft of uh, young people, young men. Um, maybe this is all part of the campaign to make it more palatable that you're fighting for holy Russia and God will, by by not resisting the draft, by not resisting your call-up orders, you will be doing God's work. Whatever it is, I theologically, I find this troublesome. And politically, for the Russian Orthodox Church, I think this is very dangerous. What? Well, I am going to go a step further, George. Heresy. Well, Kevin, you have a beard, so you can call the Orthodox <laughs> heretics. <laughs> That's good. And All right, the thing let's thing is, Yeah. Well, I, the other thing is that these Russian Orthodox will die, will go to heaven for killing other Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox. It just doesn't make any sense. There's no, uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing here. Now, yeah. Corral is not the only crazy bishop. We have another uh, Roman Catholic bishops in Belgium. They want to have uh, gay weddings. I know that uh, the Pope came down on the Germans for having such thoughts. What's going to happen to the Belgians? Well, just as Carol's become a Catholic, the Belgian Catholic bishops have joined the Germans in becoming Episcopalians. Hmm. They have come up with a liturgy for the blessing of same-sex unions. They've not gone the marriage route yet where they are proposing at a synodical level that the church bless homosexual unions as holy and godly. And the Germans uh, tried to do this, but the uh, at the end of the day, they didn't have enough votes. They fell short by one or two votes and the bishops it has to be passed by the, you know, the both houses of the Senate and get a two thirds majority of the bishops. They fell short among the German bishops, but in Belgium, They've got the, uh, they've already got the bishops online. So now it gets handed to Rome to say, are you people crazy? Um, are my Catholic friends are not so much as annoyed and irritated and perturbed by the actions of the Belgian bishops because the Belgian church along with the Dutch and the Germans have been the most, among the most liberal. Why they're so animated is because the inaction of Pope Francis, um, Pope Francis really did not directly come down against the Germans. He let others do that, and he let critics like Cardinal Orinze, the uh, African, uh, and uh, some of the African cardinals really do the heavy lifting in this. You can't do this. You cannot bless mm-hmm. what the catechism says is sin. And Francis has a little, been a little absent without leave on these issues for the taste of many, many Catholics that I've in been in conversation with well watching some of the roman catholic churches and parishes here in america especially in our big liberal cities like la new york chicago they're not too far away from you know 
endorsing and proposing this within the decade. Um, and I would not be surprised if the next church that stands out and says, well, hey, we want to do this too, would be the uh, North American Roman Catholic Church. Well, North America is a bit split. America is a bit split. Let's talk about America because I, I will have a little more confidence there. Uh, there um, <laughs> the, uh, there are two American churches. There's the Church of the Old Boy, the Pink Palace Network. Mm -hmm. um, the ones tied to the former Cardinal Archbishop of Washington and Cardinal Tobin and all these people. And I'm not making any personal aspersions against anybody except the one who's been defrocked. But they have a very progressive view of human sexuality. Um, the Jesuit James Martin is on Twitter all the time advancing a cause that uh, makes him indistinguishable from the Episcopal Church of the USA. And he's, he's never disciplined, he's never suspended, he's never told to you know, put a cork in it. Uh, you're teaching false doctrine. Whereas uh, then we have other por portions of the Catholic Church in the United States that are very strong, very traditional, and they're actually doing well and not just because they have people moving here from Mexico, but they're uh, the traditionalist side, and that's not the right word because that has a specific meaning, but those who hold to, if you will, n normal Catholicism, they're not doing that badly in this secular age. So I, I see some leadership in the Northeast, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in San Diego, uh, pushing whole heartedly for blessing of same-sex unions that's as far as they want to go right now but that will be resisted very strongly by many many rank and file clergy but i think it most especially by the laity i think this is a lip this is a this is a bridge too far for the catholic laity in the united states uh yeah but i i mentioned the decade yeah you know, i think what we saw over time with the episcopal church something that was unthinkable uh 25 years ago slowly got introduced into the the culture of the church and now everything that was unthinkable is is almost common practice and i think that it's going to slowly work its way into the roman catholic church uh here in america as well probably but the harder th the harder thing for the catholics is that they have a magisterium they have the buck stops here guy they have francis mm -hmm. Uh, and as an Episcopalian, as an Anglican, we do not have a magisterium. We have sort of the uh, consensus opinion. And the problem with the Episcopal Church over the last 40 years is that they don't give a darn about the consensus of the Anglicans. Nope. When you have... Uh, the problem is Francis's silence or inattention, mm -hmm. allowing, allowing the liberal progressive wing to really go as far as they want and so, so if you but, have a but so if the magisterium is absent you they are like the episcopal church and in one sense we're almost approaching a degree of anarchy mm -hmm. where whatever what each bishop each group each parish can soon do what is right in their own eyes and this has been the anglican problem when we had a common culture based upon the Bible and the prayer book and tradition and reason and all that, uh, we could have disputes and disagreements, but we knew where to go to resolve this into the Bible. We don't have that anymore. Uh, we have, uh, when you look at the disputes in England over homosexuality, it is the justice crowd versus the Bible crowd. And we're talking from, we're reading two different scripts. And there's no compromise, there's no way to bridge that divide, because what is godly and holy for the justice people is not godly and holy for the Bible people. In Catholicism, when you have a magisterium, when you have a tradition, when you have all of this that is laid down, and then those responsible for keeping us centered, or those of us who are Catholic centered, don't do their job. And then you allow the James Martins to teach a false doctrine um you're basically that's a harder battle for a catholic than it is for an anglican because yeah. you know as a as a floridian 
oh, these people in New York or San Francisco, so they're always been crazy. I, you know, yeah, 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 that's them. That's not me. Their words have no bearing on my salvation or on my teaching. That's an Anglican attitude. Uh, we're, we're, we're basically Presbyterians with bishops, as opposed to the Catholic model, which is we're McDonald's, where we're homogenous across the United States, and a Big Mac in Seattle tastes the same as a Big Mac in Miami. But when we start having this regionalization, and you don't know what you're getting, that's a harder problem for the Catholics to overcome, in my opinion. Okay. Next story, the divorce papers are out uh, for the Diocese of South Carolina. We know who's getting what uh, in a mediated, uh, self-mediated uh, description of what they wanted to uh, set forth. Boy, that was a bad sentence. <laughs> Basically, the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina and the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina have come to terms about a separation agreement, and they will no longer take to the courts, which is good news, but uh, the kids want to know who got what, and we got the list, George. Essentially, the big asset in question was Camp Christopher, uh, the uh, youth camp, um, that, as well as rental properties owned by in Charleston and a vacant lot in Santee, are all going to, it, which are currently in the possession of the Anglican Diocese, will go to the Episcopal Diocese, uh, effective October 1st. Episcopal Diocese is going to waive any claims in the Di Anglican's offices and the historical possessions of the Anglican Diocese will be photocopied an image so that we'll both have copies of grandma's photo albums that's sort <laughs> sure of doing the history. That. yes that's fine the silver now in the possession uh, you joked about the silverware <laughs> i did i did well <laughs> if the silver that it does not belong to a specific parish that's mm -hmm. going to be given to a charleston museum uh to for public display and they'll give quit claim deeds to each other uh, for the properties um, and the pending litigation in the federal courts will be dismissed leaving in place the current federal district court orders regarding the name and seal so the Episcopal Diocese gets the old seal and the name the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina um, so basically it's it's a good settlement um, in the sense that it stops all the fighting now again, those parish fights, I think the three left that are before the three Supreme Court. Three or four left, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be touched uh, mm -hmm. by this agreement. But it allows, uh, uh, oh, and the paintings, the oil paintings of bishops, they will be copied. And uh, the copies, the original documents will be kept by the Anglican Diocese and copies given to the diocese of the episcopal diocese the original oil paintings will be given to the episcopal diocese and copies given to the anglican diocese so they really are trying to fairly do this now a cynic like me could say well uh the episcopal diocese really does need camp christopher not for youth ministries but they need to Rebel. sell it yeah and, and, and they need to they need cash they need money because they're not really a uh, at this stage they're a tiny diocese and they need the money to pay the bills so the uh it's it's like a divorce where uh, one spouse gets the liquid assets and the other spouse gets the fixed assets so no it's it, i mean now that we're at the end we can look back and say Okay, nobody wins, nobody loses. There was a, a split. They did the audible thing and tried to divide up the, the, the remaining assets because they didn't want to spend the rest of the decade in court. Got it. Smart. Uh, spend your money wisely elsewhere. If the, the true gospel uh, fills the churches and uh, uh, brings a, a greater revival to the Charleston area, to South Carolina, this is going to be great because they're not going to be focused on what they're reading in the papers every couple of weeks about the diocese and court. Th that's very good. Um, and I think it, it is time to move on. I think both of these bishops saw that. You know, we can do this forever, and they would have if they, it, you know, or that we can uh, uh, cut anchor and move. And that's what they did, George. My uh, senior warden, uh, 
ex senior warden. She stepped down last year when her term ended. Uh, moved here from Charleston, and she was a member of Old Saint Andrews, Old, Old Saint somebody. Mm-hmm. And so she knows the diocese intimately well, and she knows all the players, all the old former players, Mark Lawrence, and all this and that, and the uh, interim Episcopal bishops. And her opinion uh, is that uh, the Episcopal diocese and the Anglican diocese really are not going to be competing because they're going against two very different groups, de- demographics. Old Charleston, old Episcopal, old South Carolina is firmly in the Anglican camp. The New South Episcopal Church, the new uh, the newcomers, uh, the uh, progressives in the diocese, politically and socially, they're attracted to the Episcopal Church. And the Anglican Church is making a play for the rising, uh, you know, like the one, the church in Mount Pleasant, the huge one. In other words, the Beautiful. Yeah, Mount Pleasant, the yeah. soccer mom yeah. churches, the southern soccer moms, that's going to the Anglicans, while the Episcopalians are just basically trying to hold their own. So we really are not seeing a lot of uh, conflict over uh, groups. And the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Diocese is making a great push into the African American community. So, you know, the Anglican Episcopal Diocese is starting from a much smaller base and is essentially looking to keep those same people and people like them, while the Anglican Diocese is seeking to keep its historic following plus expand into these new areas. Uh, people who have been brought up as Baptists, people from the African American community, people moving there from other parts of the country. So we'll see how this plays out. Yeah. All right, our next story. I'm going to skip one of the smaller stories here just for time. Uh, progressive meeting about living, love, and faith report. We got a report from one of our reviewers that they're going to have a meeting or that uh, it's being offered to them to explain upfront that this living love and faith report by the Church of England may not be going their way. And I thought we should talk about this, George. Well, Colin Coward, who is a uh, acquaintance friend of Kevin and mine, <coughs> published a, an article on his blog, which we reprinted on Anglican Inc., announcing that eight progressive organizations were going to meet with uh, a number of bishops on the Living Love and Faith Committee to express their views on how things are going and what they want to see to happen. Now, Colin was writing that, you know, I've not seen this publicized and I'm unsure as to whether I should even announce this, but hey, nobody's told me not to. So he announced this. Now, the meeting, I don't th- I think the meeting t- may take place uh, tomorrow, the 1st of October. I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. But what I find fascinating is that there seems to be a pattern here in the Church of England. At the Lambeth Conference, we had these pre-conference uh, papers, well, resolutions, yes. and the one on human sexuality had the statement that, that we're going to basically either affirm or say we need to study more the uh, Lambeth 110 which caused the liberals to have go ballistic bananas we didn't know oh, this is terrible blah 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 and they demanded and got a meeting with justin welby and tim Thor- with with tim thornton uh, not justin welby with tim thornton uh bishop tim thornton and got the agenda got all the papers changed to reflect their concerns no conservative option was given in other words the conservatives were not able to have a meeting Well, now we're seeing the same thing, except in living, love, and faith. The liberals, progressives, are being given an opportunity for a private sit-down with the leadership. But it doesn't seem that, you know, Sam Margrave, a member of General Senate, a conservative who's contributed to Anglican, and says, why aren't we being asked to do this? Yeah. Why, why, the, the lack of, you know, his point is the lack of transparency and the lack of balance. Um why you know you may have individuals who can speak to these bishops and have pressure groups with private access but why can't the elected members of general senate who are supposed to represent the church of england have equal say in this so there's a great on the conservative side there's suspicion and actually on the liberal side there's fear that they're going to get played once again 
Uh, and guess what? It's happened many times in the past. Now, we've had these same reports given out by the Church of England every five to seven years. They put out a, uh, a little research study. We, you know, we continue to study the issue. We continue to study the issue because we hope in studying the issue we can change our minds. And uh, never happens, hasn't happened yet. And I think they're meeting together with uh, these progressives to say, you're not going to believe this. We still haven't changed our mind. What can we offer you as a little token uh, so you won't uh, get up and leave? Uh, and so I, that's the only thing I can see coming out of this, George. Well, I, Kevin, I believe you're right because the mantra of Justin Welby is unity, unity, unity. Yeah. Truth doesn't matter so long as we're all able to smile for the photo at the end of the show. Mm-hmm. On unrelated news, completely unrelated news, it seems that GAFCON is going to have a meeting in Britain for those uh, disaffected priests who may or may not want to stay in the Church of England uh, after seeing what happened at Lambeth and all the other stuff in the Church of England. And uh, I don't know if it's going to happen by a Zoom or in person, but the heads of GAFCON and some heads of the ACNA are headed over there, George. On the 22nd of October at uh, Christ Church Newland, which was Melvin Tinker's church, the late Melvin Tinker, up in Hull, the Anglican uh, Network in England, along with the GAFCON leadership, is holding a meeting for clergy and of the Church of England and others who may be similarly interested. Clergy, though. And it's headlined, You Are Not Alone, You Have a Home. And the visitors, and I don't know whether they'll be it's labeled with input. I don't know whether this means from uh, via Zoom or in person, but uh, Foley Beach, who's uh, primate of the ACNA and chairman of GAFCON, uh, J. Behan, B E H A N, I've never known how to pronounce that, Bahan or Behan, who's the uh, bishop of the uh, GAFCON diocese in New Zealand, Julian Dobbs from the Diocese of the Living Word in ACNA and Charlie Masters from ANIC, Anglican Network in Canada, which is part of the ACNA. They are all going to give their perspective. And in some ways, this is a hope in the future conference, except it's closed. There's limited seating. Uh, tickets are free, but uh, I don't think they're going to let Eddie Tom, Dick, and Harry in uh, to disrupt or whatnot. I remember going to the Plano conference and sitting with uh, David Booth Beers, who was there taking notes and seeing what uh, Bob Duncan was saying and everything. <laughs> Booth Beers was Beers was the former chancellor to the presiding bishop and the leader, the lawyer for the Episcopal Church through all this stuff until his death. Now, this is, and also uh, the ANIE is also going to have a consecration of their two new bishops. We don't know the names yet. And these guys may be there to be co-consecrators. Mm -hmm. um, but what is, I think is important is that what ANIE is doing, and I'm glad GAFCON is taking a lead in this, is saying uh, there are options, alternatives. If you cannot take the Church of England anymore, we are here. This is what, this is the point that they're trying to make. And we'll see if this is infectious and causes people to join or or not. Well, GAFCON too, at the end, Peter Jensen got up and said, we're going to go take the shores of England. We're going to retake Anglicanism and provide an alternate <coughs> to the Church of England. And that went over like a lead balloon. Because people there in the Church of England were still willing to give Justin Welby and the leadership of the Church, uh, Church of England the benefit of the doubt. And I think over time now, they're seeing there really is no way forward because unity is the God and not God the God. And here we are now with, uh, I think, a really good portion of disaffected clergy willing to, to entertain what uh, Archbishop Foley Beach has to say, willing to entertain what GAFCON may provide. Um, where before five and ten years ago no, you're, not time yet let's give Justin a chance what's missing from all this of course the Church of England bishops mm -hmm. and Anglo-Catholics the people invited to speak none of them you could call an Anglo-Catholic 
Now, people in the Anglo-Catholic movement in the UK say, well, we do have the society, and the society bishops are our leaders. That may be true, but I know of two of the society leaders who are non-celibate homosexuals. Okay. Uh, they're not going, they're not pulling you guys out of the Church of England because they're, no. they're, they're all who they are. And Forward and Faith UK has basically morphed into an affirming Catholicism group. It's very different from Forward and Faith in the US. So one of Gavin Ashenden's complaints two, three, four years ago was that this is not the, the lifeboat doesn't seem to have any seats for the Anglo Catholics. And which is, I would say, is one of the reasons why Gavin jumped to Rome. Um, but not to the ordinary. Um, maybe it, it would have been, uh, in my opinion, to have had a Jack Eicher go or a Keith Ackerman be there to give a, a an Anglo-Catholic, clear and precise Anglo-Catholic viewpoint. I think that would open it up to many more people in the Church of England because it's just shooting for one party, the evangelical party, isn't enough. In my opinion, yeah, I you know, I, and I agree with you. But one of the problems, and all the Anglo Catholics I know from Britain are more liberal uh, in many different ways than the evangelicals, and you know, you know, stay maybe three or four of them. I I, I can see the trouble, and this is a, a trouble that existed for generations. It's you know, not going to solve overnight. Yeah, you, you know. yeah, that the the, the Anglo Catholics believe the evangelicals betrayed them over the women's uh, order mm -hmm. or over women bishops in the general mm -hmm. synod. So yeah. there's a lot of hard feeling um, yeah. and traditional distrust. Um, when I was a priest in England, uh, I was an American in England. I wasn't a, by any means part of the English world. Uh, but I went to, was invited to a meeting of reform, and I went and I wore my collar, and I was the only one wearing a clergy collar, and they all thought that I was some, you know, super Anglo-Catholic. Um, because, e even though I don't consider myself uh, that, but, you know, Bob Duncan is looked upon as being a an evangelical, uh, is, is looked on differently, by, evangel by evangelicals in England than he is in evangelicals in the United States because their the borders, the party lines are so fiercely drawn uh, on on second, third, fourth order issues like whether or not you wear a clergy collar. Uh, what you know, there are generations, and then of course there's the old boy system that has blown up under Jonathan Fletcher and John Smythe um, that still hasn't rid itself. Uh, completely from the evangelical world. All right, we got time left. Uh, last week, I kind of referred to the story about a pro-life activist who was arrested by the uh, SWAT team from the FBI, and uh, a lot of people took interest in that on Facebook that I was going to talk about it. Well, let's talk about it, George. Here in America, uh, we currently have uh, one-party rule uh, with the Democratic Party and a, a disaffected, uh, disassociated uh, president who uh, gets lost when he gets on stage. I think uh, when I mentioned before that the, the, the Christians have lost the benefit of the doubt, everything Christians stand for has lost the benefit of the doubt in society. And there was, when something like this happens, I would have expected uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, all this outrage from the media. The media here just covered as a factual event. Some mean, violent, horrible pro-life activist uh, was rightfully arrested by the SWAT team of the FBI is the USA Today story. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of enhancing that a little, but uh, things have really changed, George. It's a very frightening story. A um a Catholic layman, married man with seven children, who's been involved in the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, uh, he and his son, uh, I think it was a young teenage son, were out, were part of a uh, paper, uh, lobbying group outside of, an, outside of an abortion clinic, handing out flyers. 
and uh, an abortion activist shoved his son, attacked his son, and he shoved the abortion office activist. The man called the police on them, and the local police in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia, mind you, is led by one of these Soros prosecutors who yeah. uh, is, is quick to uh, politicize justice. The Philadelphia police said there was no case there. A civil suit was filed for assault by the man who was shoved, and the and the courts in Pennsylvania dismissed it. Well, the FBI in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania on their own, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania Attorney's Office, federal courts, on their own, took it to an in institute, a, uh, uh, a prosecution under these laws that makes uh, violence in front of a, uh, an abortion clinic a crime. And this man was notified by this and he as an attorney agreed to surrender himself but the FBI said no and the the FBI sent uh, two three dozen heavily armed officers with automatic weapons and flak jackets and helmets to his home arrested him in front of his children and hauled him off for a case that has been twice dismissed in state courts and he is now facing up to 10 years imprisonment for shoving a man who assaulted his son and he is he is being defended by the uh, by one of these Christian legal organizations. Uh, but this is just abhorrent. Uh, no, nobody's been arrested by the FBI for the hundred and I think it's fifty uh, uh, attacks on churches and abor abortion clinics since the uh, surrounding the abortion ruling. Nobody's been arrested. And here's one guy who is being arrested for something that's been dismissed twice by the, 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 the local courts in Pennsylvania. The, the politicization of our, this is, this is a step so far beyond, uh, th this is evil, this is evil. We have a corrupt and broken government who use it, you know, who uses the laws and the uh, a weaponized police to silence political opposition. Remember Eli Gonzalez? Oh yes, and my the the boy who floated over from Cuba. So in, in you know just bringing up a little recreation, Kevin, you're just being so outrageous. There's no way the media years ago would have been mad if the FBI raided and uh, sent the SWAT team in and, and just overreacted to everything. Well, Elon Gonzalez, the, the Cuban migrant who floated over on a boat and had a foster family here, it was in Florida, I think, right? Uh, Miami, Little Havana. Yeah. Yeah, got involved in a court case where they did not want to uh, send uh, Elon back to uh, Cuba. And uh, the courts eventually came around and said, well, you have to send him back. Well, to enforce that, uh, I forget what her name was, the head of the FBI at the time, sent Janet FBI, Reno. Janet Reno, that's her name, sent the, the FBI SWAT team in, in the dark of night, like at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, bang on the door, broke the door down, broke two or three of the main windows to get in, and they found little Elon in the closet saying, I don't want to go. Well, what did the press do then, George? They... Who, lo who lost her job over that? Janet I don't Reno. remember. Yeah. She didn't Janet. lose her job. Yeah, she... Uh, I thought she stepped... She resigned early because of uh, that and what happened with uh, David Koresh. Another wonderful FBI raid. Yeah. If that's, I must have missed that because I don't that's remember right. that. I don't remember. She didn't get fired, but I thought she had to step down early, and then uh, later she uh, succumbed to cancer. But the the FBI has done this in the past, and they were corrected by the media for it and by society at large. They said, "No, we we're not going to do this. This isn't who we are." So now it's who we are, George. All right, that is exactly one hour. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 762 of Anglican Unscripted.